Sri Aurobindo is describing how our experience and valuation of everything in the universe is radically changed as we begin to dwell in the cosmic consciousness. All of our normal living has been in a broken, partial, personal standard of our consciousness and that is what we call the ignorance in which everything in our experience is limited in capacity in force and unable to respond in the right measure to the impact of the experience itself and all through the result of this is limitation, weakness, incapacity, grief, pain, struggle, contradictions <coughs> and the duality which is as if eternal. <coughs> Our experiences are also in fragments. There is a piece and another piece and another piece we accumulate them, combine them, join them somehow and even that changes over time. Whereas the reality is there is one, indivisible, whole, infinite. And so all of that we have described so far, which is our experience, is the very opposite of the reality. And so he says, by entering into the cosmic consciousness, we participate in that all vision and see everything in the values of the infinite and the one. The infinite and the one itself has its own vision of things. Its experience of the universe is a oneness, which is infinite. Its experience of a grain of sand is also a oneness, infinite, putting up a special aspect, a special front. We do not suffer by the limitations of our mind, life and body, for we no longer live in these, but in the infinity of the spirit. And these we view in their right value and place and purpose in the manifestation, as degrees of the Supreme Being, conscious force and delight of Satchidananda, veiling and manifesting himself in the cosmos. So now here comes a critical aspect of this experience so far, of which now a greater fulfillment will be described later. You are in the consciousness of cosmic awareness. You have mind, life, body. You see them only as specialized fronts, reduced degrees in expression of the same one Satchidananda. But in those, you may not experience this infinity and oneness. You are in a consciousness that knows infinity and oneness, knows these as formed by and a play of infinity and oneness, 
But if you enter your physical consciousness or your mental consciousness, then you would not experience it there. Except perhaps in your conscious registration in the cosmic, but not in the thing itself of the mind or the body. It's similar to what we may experience, again as an analogy. Your finger is hurt, it's paining greatly. You can put your full attention on the pain, identify with the pain and start screaming, jumping, waving your finger, hoping the pain goes away. Of course it does not. Or you step out of the body sensation, you are mind observing a pain sensation hitting you and say, ah, I can choose to not jump. I can choose to bear it perhaps or even ignore it because I am not the pain. So you can choose a poise which is outside, which is free or enter inside it and of course you are experiencing the pain but you are experiencing pain, not the divine delight at least in those parts. So that's why he says, for we no longer live in these, we do not suffer by the limitations because we don't live in these. And we see from that poise the right value and place. Later what he will describe in two paragraphs down is how we can actually bring that consciousness into these layers and open the consciousness on these layers laterally until on these layers also begin, we can begin to experience cosmic consciousness as cosmic mind, cosmic life, even the cosmic matter of which our body is a part. We cease to judge men and things by their outward appearances and are delivered from hostile and contradictory ideas and emotions. For it is the soul that we see, the divine that we seek and find in every thing and creature. And the rest has only a secondary value to us in a scheme of relations which exist now for us only as self-expressions of the divine and not as having any absolute value in themselves. So here's this whole drama taking place. In this cosmic consciousness, you see the soul of things and the interplay. And although you're seeing all the other aspects, they have a secondary value. As an example, if as you live in a consciousness like this, you look at two people quarreling. And one does not have to enter even a cosmic consciousness. You look at two children playing in the kindergarten. They're upset with each other, they start abusing each other, they start hitting each other, they turn away, uh, detesting each other. What value would you give to it? Oh, they are children playing. Nothing. Tomorrow they will forget. As they grow up, they may be the best of friends. Maybe they're destined to be best of friends. That's why they keep coming together and fighting all the time. Something draws them together. You're looking at something completely different behind the appearances and in a longer span of time. Having been through it yourself, you can also identify what it feels like as a child in kindergarten when you felt as if the whole world has come to an end because you lost a pencil or broke a little toy. And now from this poise you look at it and say, ah, that's okay, it will pass. And the child says, no, but it's my car, it's my toy. Oh, don't worry, we'll get you another. No, I want that one. And it's, it's a complete disconnect. But in your consciousness, it's phenomenal, superficial, passing, it's a wave. Knowing that even his suffering is not a real suffering. Because he is not that which he thinks he is. And so when you look at the scene in the world, and now we can extend it to a wider scale, even adults fighting, even countries going to war, even people bombing each other. If you step back into the big picture, it's a struggle of forces out of which something is going to emerge and you see what is going to emerge. You see ultimately at the level of the soul, no one is really ultimately killed or destroyed or hurt. They go through cycles. Some of them have even chosen to take birth in their space for various reasons. And though you can identify with the pain and the suffering and all the strife of the people in their mind and emotions and senses, 
in that larger consciousness you can see its place in the larger scheme it doesn't mean the strife is necessary but since they refuse to change that's the passage they have chosen to pass through if they could change and you can assist them in changing which is part of your role in the world they may be avoided from having to pass through that suffering or find a shorter route through the suffering than the longer route and so on so you're still seeing things from deeper values of the soul and it is the divine that we seek and find in everything and creature and the rest has only a secondary value as self expressions of the divine so too no event can disturb us since the distinction of happy and unhappy beneficent and maleficent happenings lose its force and all is seen in its divine value and its divine purpose and this is easy to do when you look back at history it's happened there's nothing you can do to change it and you look at the sweep of history and the events and some of them quite terrible and you can see what good came of it what evil came of it over time even the evil served to promote a stronger or greater good eventually and somehow we blur the details during the wars millions of people may have died and suffered in the most extreme terrible way at least during the period of those few days of the war but out of that what has come the world has learnt lessons grown and is now a better place and has ensured that it will never go back to repeat such a thing and if we had not passed through this there may still be the danger that we do not know how risky it is to ever indulge in those kinds of movements and there's still the risk that it might happen now with greater power with greater weapons and tools and so in the larger scheme you might say well it was perhaps the best thing to happen at that time of course avoidable but given the condition of humanity as it was then it seems to have been the most rapid smooth passage out from a great danger shri rabindu has an interesting passage i'm tempted to read from that where he discusses precisely why india had to go through the phase of colonization and uh, he describes exactly the fine details i'll just load this he says it's a long passage so i will skip portions of it is responding to an article by one dr kumar swami he says dr kumar swami complains of the survivals of the past in the preparations for the future but no movement however vigorous can throw off in a few years the effects of a whole century we must also re- we must remember also why the degradation and national denationalization of which the writer complains came into being and then he explains painful but necessary work had to be done on india and because the english nation were the fittest instrument for his purpose god led them all over those thousands of miles of alien ocean gave strength to their hearts and subtlety to their brains and set them up in india to do his work <laughs> now you see how profound this is an entire nation is given strength and subtlety and skill in order to go and invade another nation to do his work and literally it's across the world across the oceans it could have been from somewhere else much closer by what he says uh, the english nation were the fittest instrument for his purpose and he'll explain why shortly to set them up in india to do his work which they have been doing faithfully if blindly ever since and are doing at the present moment this sri arbind was written 100 years ago they don't know that they are serving the divine purpose so the spirit and ideals of india had come to be confined in a mold which however beautiful was too narrow and slender to bear the mighty burden of our future 
When that happens, the mold has to be broken and even the ideal lost for a while in order to be recovered free of constraint and limitation. Now imagine he's looking at this scheme of unfoldment. An entire civilization on which work has been done over thousands of years. Now it's come to a point where the mold, however beautiful, is limited. It has to be broken. The ideal may be lost in the process and then it will be recovered from a freer consciousness. We have to recover the Aryan, Aryan spirit and ideal and keep it intact but enshrined in new forms and more expansive institutions. We have to treasure jealously everything in our social structure, manners, institutions, which is of permanent value or spirit or helpful to the future. But we must not cave in the expanding and aggressive spirit of India in temporary forms, which are the creation of the last few hundred years. So you can see the, the sweep of it. Forms have been created over a few hundred years. They're too limited. The mold is broken down, then comes. That would be a vain and disastrous endeavor. Can you imagine at a time when there is great social struggle and people are clinging on to forms which are so precious for them, someone comes and says, no, you need to let go of those forms. And it's even okay to lose the ideal for a while so that you can recover it from a freer consciousness. It would not make sense to an individual. It would not even make sense to a collective, but it makes sense across time. And so people are led in spite of themselves unconsciously through that passage because they cannot see and cannot know. Then he says, the mold is broken. We must remold in larger outlines and with a richer content. For the work of destruction, England was best fitted by her stubborn individuality and by that very commercialism and materialism which made her the anti-type in temper and culture of the race she governed. So he's describing the characteristics which are the opposite of the governed race and that's why it is useful to have this to come to break the molds. And we can actually go into each of those words and take examples and it will be quite fascinating as an exercise to do that. And then he says, She was chosen too for the unrivaled efficiency and skill with which she has organized an individualistic and materialistic democracy. Draw it into ourselves and absorb the democratic spirit and methods so that we may try rise beyond them. So this passage through that whole institutionalized democratic mechanism developed in England was necessary. You will recall in 1910, Sri Aurobindo wrote, India will, it, he says, he's looking at the future, he says, it is becoming increasingly clear that India will pass through the experiment of parliamentary democracy simply to realize that it is not suited for us. But that passage will be what will allow the absorption of the democratic organization, democratic spirit and methods, so that we might rise beyond them. Our half aristocratic, half theocratic feudalism had to be broken. I was describing the structures as they remain, aristocratic, theocratic, feudal had to be broken in order that the democratic spirit of the Vedanta might be released and by absorbing all that is needed of the aristocratic and theocratic culture create for the Indian race a new and powerful political and social organization. You can see with this picture everything that is happening right now in the country, the churning which is happening, the collapse of institutions which don't work, and at the same time the struggle to make them work, and the eventual recasting of these structures. All that you can see in a sweep. 
the passage through the struggle to make these dysfunctional systems work is necessary because that's how the democratic spirit and methods will be learned and absorbed. Again, if I have to take a few examples, just indicative. If I go back to when I was 15 or so, so that's about 35 years. I remember I was coming in a van from Oroville. I used to go at that time to Orilek to work with the computers. And so I would come back sometimes in their vehicle. I was coming back in the van and there were a few people who were working with the computers there. And it was the season, within a month or so, we were to have elections. And I watched these people in the van shouting slogans, raising their hands, shouting election slogans, exciting themselves with that. And it sounded so strange to me. What is the great joy in repeating somebody else's slogans? Oh, it was they were enjoying the excitement of it. It's like if you see people watching football, people who are fans of football, and I've had these conversations with some of those types, cricket or football. They'll say, I love cricket or football. And I say, why? Oh, it's so exciting. It's so interesting. What is interesting? Nothing is happening during the cricket. They're just two people standing. One throws a ball, one hits it. And the action takes place within a few seconds. Everyone else is just standing and waiting. What's happening? It's so interesting. And if you listen to the commentary, there's this man talking away and there are pictures flashing all the time, angles changing. The excitement which is created around a non-event, that's what people get agitated by and that's what they're addicted to. The sense of being led through the fear of failure, success, winning, losing and the tension of one man about to catch on missing. So silly, so petty even. But that excitement is needed for that person as a passage in the revolution because they're still living there. Once they outgrow it, suddenly this game will become not so interesting. There's no depth, there's no strategy, there's no thought, there's just a superficial momentary excitement. Like if you take a man who's half dead and giving a few electric shocks and his hands and legs move around, that's pretty much what you're seeing in terms of consciousness, nothing else, nothing deeper awakening. But it's a passage. And so when I look back at that period, I still remember what it was like. We would ask the maidservant, who would you vote for? And they will name the party. Without thought. And you ask why? Because we've always done that. That was the answer. We've always done that. Later, a decade later, it became we will vote for whoever gives us more money. And then a decade later, it became, we don't like those people, we don't trust them, we will vote for that group, which we trust more. I can see in this the evolution, from complete inertia, this is who we vote for. We don't change. That's my tradition. Which means what? Nothing except mechanical habit. Two, something which is money-based, what serves my short-term momentary interest. And having been through it, eventually you wake up and say, I am, the short-term interest is causing me more harm. I need to think longer term. And this passage, interestingly, took place at a time when India went through the most painful churning in politics. The most extreme perversions were projected. The most divisive forces came in. And we had a series of elections, one after another, every few years. Prime ministers being changed every few years. And it was as if it was needed to have that rapid passage in order to shake up this part which was thinking short term. To waken it and say, you have to think beyond five years and ten years. Now, if at that time, in that dark passage, you tell people this is necessary, this is going to be helpful and out of this we will outgrow and become more mature, wouldn't make sense. But once you've been through it, you look back, oh yes, now you can see the value of it. I wish we could have skipped it, but given what people were living in, in the mass, it was almost inevitable and necessary. So I come back to the text. <laughs> so. In order that the democratic spirit of the Vedanta might be released, 
And by absorbing all that is needed of the aristocratic and theocratic culture, create for the Indian race a new and powerful political and social organization. Now for this we have to look ahead another decade or two. At some point there will be the recognition that the parliamentary model has failed. And a new framework would have to be created. But for that to be effective, people have to get used to the democratic methods. Stop thinking in terms of short term. Start thinking about what is important, what is valuable, and have a larger sense of the identity with national interest, not just my individual interest, my community interest, my vote bank, or whatever else. Sri Aurobindo refers when he writes elsewhere that it is a gigantic task, he says, of a kind of a national yoga that is taking place. But the whole nation as a whole is going through a yogic process. And he says, things which have to be thrown out are brought up to be experimented with so that they may be discarded before the real construction can begin. So I've paraphrased, but this is the broad line of the thinking he presents. I come back to the text. He says, we have to learn and use the democratic principle and methods of Europe in order that hereafter we may build up something more suited to our past and to the future of humanity. Interesting. It's not only drawing on the deep past from India, but what it has to create, conceive and create has a value for the future of humanity as a whole. We have to throw away the individualism and materialism and keep the democracy. Remember he described how England came with the individualism and materialism of democracy and its methods. So you have to extract the democracy and throw out those components of individualism and materialism and keep the democracy. We have to solve for the human race the problem of harmonizing and spiritualizing its impulses towards liberty, equality and fraternity. Now you see these three words were such a strong, had such a strong force in Europe with the French Revolution. But they were turned to social and political result. But the same three principles, liberty, equality and fraternity, have their spiritual value, which is the larger the revolution which is to take place still in humanity. And that is a problem, problem of harmonizing and spiritualizing the impulse towards liberty, equality and fraternity. So it has been so far developed in Europe in certain limited forms, social and political. Can we take it all the way into its spiritual potential in a collective that includes social and political and economic, but is more expressive of the spiritual? And that problem is not solved. It can only be done in a space where the spirituality is considered, is already entrenched. And for that entrenchment, there has been a long preparation. But in between there were molds and forms, which were relevant then, which now have to break, so that the whole spiritual impulse can now form in this new framework. And that's a problem which has not been solved yet. And what that means is, what mother did precisely in Oroville? She gave the framework and the guidelines, exactly the same idea there. Framework and guidelines are given, and the forms, she says, have to evolve according to the current consciousness of the people. And you have a passage through various possibilities of forms towards something which you cannot put into practice now because your consciousness is not capable of living by that standard. But through this passage of these forms, your consciousness will evolve until it's capable of doing this and that form will then be the most effective for that consciousness and its larger spiritual possibilities. So something like that taking place on this large scale in India. Now I give this as an example because it shows us how the cosmic consciousness will see things and events. So he says, so too no event can disturb us. Since the distinction 
of happy and unhappy, beneficent and maleficent happenings lose their force and all is seen in its divine value and its divine purpose. And you see the purpose here. Thus we arrive at a perfect liberation and an infinite equality. So the practical result of this cosmic consciousness because all these things we can now see in their deeper, truer value, we arrive at a perfect liberation. We are no more affected by anything which happens, even though we participate in everything. And an infinite equality. The equality itself can be of many kinds. The equality which rests on the largest infinite is of course the deepest also equality. And so we have now a picture which he gives us where we see in the vision, in the all vision, everything in the values of the infinite and the one, one whole infinite divine consciousness playing in a complex unfolding of its possibilities. And so this Sri Aurobindo now relates to the Isha Upanishad. It is this consummation of which the Upanishad speaks when it says, He in whom the Self has become all existences. How shall he have illusions? Whence shall he have grief? Who knows entirely and sees in all things oneness. And the phrase there is, Vijanata, that is the knowing entirely, Ekatvam Anupashyata, Ekatvam oneness, Anupashya seeing, sees in all things oneness, but knows entirely. Now against this knows entirely, Sri Aurobindo has put a footnote because the word Vijanata, he elaborates. Vijanata, Vidnana is the knowledge of the one and many, by which the many are seen in the terms of the one, in the infinite unifying truth, right, vast of the divine existence. So this is the supramental consciousness, seeing the oneness and the multiplicity. And it is this which he describes as knowing entirely. One in whom the self has become all existences, because you are one with the whole, it is yourself that flows into the whole. This is the change, a radical change, which comes with the cosmic consciousness and the participation in its all vision. Having said this, Sri Aurobindo always shows you first the peak. And then he points out that this peak cannot be reached because of these limitations. And then he shows you how to overcome those limitations. So now comes the next paragraph. But this is only when there is perfection in the cosmic consciousness. And that perfection we will find only in the supramental, which knows the oneness and the many equally as aspects of each other. You drop a little bit into the mental consciousness and the one and many are still have a gap, still a division. So, but this is only when there is perfection in the cosmic consciousness and that is difficult for the mental being. The mentality, when it arrives at the idea or the realization of the spirit, the divine, tends to break existence into two opposite halves, the lower and the higher existence. Now the moment you have an idea of spirit or divine, you'll find there is divine and then there's something which against that is not divine. But equally this is true not only of idea but even realization. You may realize the divine and still you will find there's something which is not divine. So if you look back at our earlier discussion of the intuitive sense of the one or the infinite, as we begin to enter into that intuitional perception and experience of it, there is still this part of the mind below which does not fully participate or it receives at best a reflection 
And if we, if we live in this, we don't know that yet. There's a gap. Something is limited. If we enter into that, we have an experience, we say, ah, this is divine, this is oneness. But when it comes to action, we drop into this lower level and in my action, I am not in it. Something remains, a gap. Tends to break existence into two opposite halves, the lower and the higher existence. Now this is something so fundamental to spiritual experience that what he describes now, you will see is the conclusion presented as absolute fact and truth in most spiritual traditions of the world. The resolution of this division also, which he will point to, which automatically comes from this division, is what you will find in almost every spiritual tradition of the world. And Sri Aurobindo will find that insufficient for the integral yoga. So, it sees on one side the infinite, the formless, the one, the peace and bliss, the calm and silence, the absolute, the vast and pure. All of these he has used capital letters. And each of these is an aspect of the experience of the divine. And among these, you have pretty much covered all of them. On the other side, on the other, it sees the finite, the world of forms, the jarring multiplicity, the strife and suffering and imperfect, unreal good, the tormented activity, the futile success, the relativity, the limited and vain and vile. You have to split and you see between these two, where can you find a transition which is which can be called continuous. How can you call all these as expressions of that? Or how can you call these ultimately originating in that? Doesn't work. Something, there's always a gap. The gap may be fine if your consciousness approaches something very high, but still something remains. If your consciousness is not so close to the high, the gap is more obvious, harsh. To those who make this division, this opposition, complete liberation is only attainable in the peace of the One. The featurelessness of the infinite, the non-becoming of the Absolute, which is to them the only real being. So when you see this, and you accept that this is a division, what can you do? You can only enter into a consciousness in which all these other limitations, distortions of that are extinguished. Which means you enter a consciousness which is completely still, all the waves coming back into silence, into oneness. Now you have none of that stuff. It's gone. All is good, all is beautiful, perfect. But you're in a consciousness which is featurelessness of the infinite. Contrast this with infinite consciousness which puts forward unendingly, infinitely varied features, appearances, waves, variations of infinite qualities pouring out unendingly and unendingly, forming this whole universe, all pouring out of the infinity. That's the featured infinite. And here it is a featureless, all that becomes quiet, all the waves subside. You're in a featureless, infinite, blank, nirvanic consciousness. To be free, all values must be destroyed. All limitations not only transcended, but abolished. It's not enough to be free of them and still it's there. You must extinguish completely. They have the liberation of the divine rest. But what are they missing? but not the liberty of the divine action. Because in order to enter into action, you must re-enter this domain of the limited forms. You can't have that. So you withdraw and you are in the rest. 
they enjoy the peace of the transcendent but not the cosmic bliss of the transcendent this is the interesting thing the bliss aspect represents a dynamic power also you can have the peace and a kind of a blissful peace but the bliss of the transcendent is in his pouring into the infinite possibilities even as he is free of them the cosmic bliss of the transcendent their liberty depends upon abstention from the cosmic movement it cannot dominate and possess cosmic existence itself so such a person would be free as long as they stay out of the movement the moment the person is forced to come out of his cave literal or figurative in consciousness suddenly the world hits you hmm? yes <laughs> and they cannot dominate and possess cosmic existence but it is also possible for them to realize and participate in the immanent as well as the transcendent peace so you can say i live in that transcendence but i can accept to be in the presence which fills all things so i'm also in the immanent it is right here right now i'm in the midst of all this chaos i live in the peace which fills everything here but what it means he says still the division is not cured the liberty they enjoy is that of the silent unactive witness not the liberty of the divine master consciousness which possesses all things so i live like this i experience the peace filling everything i live in that peace i am always in relation to that in my activities but when the knock comes and hits me i am unable to master it i am swayed i am pushed i am a victim if i put forward a counter push it destabilizes me my consciousness may be in the peace but in my action it is still a fragmented action unstable not expressive of that peace and liberty so he says the liberty they enjoy is that of the silent unacting witness not the liberty of the divine master which possesses all things delights in all casts itself into all forms of existence without fear of fall without fear of fall or loss or bondage or stain this is an extraordinary idea you see you might be in that consciousness and when you move into action you are in this fragmented incapable even distorted action but the divine himself is in the full power of the action in the universe and what is his experience he is in a freedom of the master consciousness which possesses all things everything is his in his grip he is in them holding them from within entirely as master and then delights in all so first he is possessing because they are all himself in form he is enjoying in them casts itself into all forms of existence he pours out to become other forms new forms not just the existing one he is pouring out new forms out of himself and throwing himself into those forms fully now one who is not truly master can throw out a power but must maintain his poise of freedom but this mastery which the divine has he is free even as he throws himself utterly with full abandon and the interesting thing here he says without fear of fall or loss or bondage or stain if i am in this wonderful consciousness and if i enter fully into my action what if i fall what if i lose my freedom that's the first fear that means i don't have the true mastery of the action or what if i lose something of that status i get bound into a limited form i will lose my 
total knowledge. I will lose my all power. I will lose my bliss. I will get stuck in the limitation and the suffering and all the rest that follows. The loss or bondage. I might get so deeply stuck that I, I might not be able to get back. What if entering into the human body, I will lose my divinity, I will forget that I was divine and I will think I am a human bound in a human limitation. And so I avoid or hold myself back or only put myself so much as I can keep the balance of retaining this freedom while still participating partially in enjoyment. But what does the divine do? He pours himself utterly, entirely, with full abandon, no limits. Remember it is the same one who pours himself entirely to become grain of sand, as he is also supporting the entire universe. Without bondage and or stain. And the stain is having entered something of me now acquires the touch of ignorance, incapacity, <clears throat> something gets distorted, limited, even though the bulk of me is free. And this is often the experience people have, even from a state of great liberation and realization, as and to the degree to which they engage with things of life, a part of the consciousness with en which engages is stained. The practical consequence of this is those who do not have the true freedom to be able to enter, the true power, the true mastery which we are, we are aiming at, would need to protect themselves and their purity. In practice you will see in all the spiritual traditions existent, especially the ascetic types, they create layers at the core is the purest and then one layer to insulate the purest from the slightly impure and another layer to insulate that from the more impure and 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 all the way through in order to protect that purity those who are too impure are not allowed to come in to experience because they will bring their impurity in they can only come up to one or two steps to nourish themselves and then go back so that they may purify themselves more and be worthy of a deeper entry. Otherwise, you are in danger of losing what has been built up. And so what you actually do is create layers of insulation. And which means the purity held is not powerful enough to be able to face the universe. It's fragile, it's partial. But here, what is the Divine Himself? He does not need that. He pours himself without fear of fall or loss or bondage or stain. And this is the liberty of the master consciousness which possesses and delights all things, casts itself into all forms. All the rights of the spirit are not yet possessed. There is still a denial, a limitation, a holding back from the entire oneness of all existence. And all this he says, remember it started with, to those who make this division. If you have accepted this division, all of this is the consequence. <coughs> the workings of mind, life, body, are viewed from the calm and peace of the spiritual planes of the mental being and are filled with that calm and peace. So, your consciousness living in the cosmic consciousness from the spiritual plane of your higher ranges of mind and you see mind, life, body are projections into which that calm and peace may fill but they are not possessed by and subjected to the law of the all-mastering spirit. That has not yet entered and that is not playing overtly. And why is this? He says, this is when the mental being has taken its station in its own spiritual planes, in the mental planes of Sat, Chit, Ananda, and casts down their light and delight upon the lower existence. 
but it is possible, he says, to attempt to arrive at a kind of cosmic consciousness by dwelling on the lower planes themselves, breaking their limitations laterally, as we have said, and calling down into them the light and largeness of the higher existence. Not only spirit is one, but mind, life, matter are one. So now this whole thing will now take a different direction with this pouring down of the higher consciousness into the mind, into the life, into the physical frame, there will be this widening and the breaking of boundaries laterally. And still there will be the question of which is the power entering? And so far he says, this is when the mental being has taken its station in its own spiritual planes, in the mental planes of Satchit Nananda. What does that mean? You will recall a few chapters ago, Sri Aurobindo had discussed this question of the mind being unable to experience the spiritual directly. It either blanks out when it enters the spirit or comes back and its mind again losing the spirit. And the only way to be able to experience that without losing your mental awareness, without going into a trance the swoon, is if you recognize that within the mental planes there are finer gradations corresponding to those spiritual planes. And if you can enter into those gradations, developing in your mental consciousness those possibilities, unfolding those layers inside the mind, you can still be mentally aware in a spiritual experience. And that was the secret, the key we had discussed, in order to be able to have this experience of the cosmic consciousness. And this is taking place, he says, therefore, in the mental planes of Satchit and Ananda. So briefly we will step back. Remember, seven planes, Satchit, Ananda, the supramental, Vijnana, and then the three lower mind, life, matter. But all seven are principles or powers of consciousness. And therefore they are present everywhere. So within the seven planes are finer sevenfold divisions of the seven working within the larger principle. Within each of those are finer seven gradations and so on. So 49, 7 into 7, 49 finer subplanes. In the mental plane you have the equivalent of the material grade of consciousness in mind, where form predominates in the mental domain, the principle of matter and form. Similarly, the principle of life force and kinesis of energy in the mental plane. And then there's the mental proper, which is the mind as it operates in itself. And then there is the equivalent of the super mind in the mental plane, which takes in us the form of the self-aware intellect. See, in the quality of mental consciousness, the self-aware intellect it plays the equivalent role of the supramental principle. It knows the division, it knows the oneness, it organizes things in right relation to each other. But it's a power of the intellect, it's power of the mind. It's only reflecting the principle of supermind, not truly supermind. But similarly, there are three higher gradations of Satchidananda inside the mental plane. And within each of those finer gradations. And so in fact, in a mental consciousness, one can awaken to increasingly higher and higher planes of spiritual experience, representing those powers here in a limited framework of a mental consciousness. And so it is this which he says, this is when the mental being takes its station in its own spiritual planes, in the mental planes of Satchitananda, and casts down their light and delight upon the lower existences. And so, the perfection of the cosmic consciousness is not yet, because the mental being keeps somewhere this very fine division, this gap, which separates the higher and the lower. Later, as he has, after he discusses the lateral opening in the full frame of the mind, life and body down to the physical consciousness, he will describe what happens when the body participates in the cosmic consciousness. Having done all that, there will still be the remaining idea 
that as this higher ranges of the mind light up the whole and complete this experience, they begin to open to a still finer grade of pure supramental consciousness. And as that begins to dawn, it releases the final veil separating the spirit from the inferior appearance and makes complete and heals entirely the gap. And that's when the, you have the complete, perfected divine manifestation in the cosmic consciousness. But this is the framework which we have to look at of what we will further read so that we can understand where we are in the larger scheme. Having read all this, we will come back to this same paragraph next time to look at the deeper nuances. We have read through to get the full sense of where he is going with the logic. But there are many important nuances here. When he gives you that list, it sees on one side the infinite, the formless, the one, the peace and bliss, the calm, the silence, the absolute, the vast and pure. And then on the other side all those opposites. Why is he taking trouble to list all of these? Each of these is a major aspect of the experience of the Divine. Each of these can be an entry point or be experienced as if the total of the Divine Consciousness. And corresponding to each is a distortion or a limitation in the domain of the divided consciousness. And we will look at these relationships across and what they mean, why they are all capitalized, what they represent. And to the extent that our mind can conceive of and dwell on each of these images or aspects of the Divine, we will be plastifying our mind, making it more ready to receive directly those experiences. And if we can hold ourselves on the edge of the intuitive perception of each of those experiences, it is a great gift. And it prepares the mind not only to have those experiences, which we could have of any one of them or more, but to have them all eventually. That is what would be the most wide, the most complete experience of the Divine, even as our mind opens up to a higher intuitive and beyond consciousness. So we will explore this further and other nuances of the rest of the paragraph. And we'll pause here now for questions, comments. Could we have entered the journey if we knew what it involved? Think of it this way. From the poise where the decision was made, you were in that... What's the word? All vision. You knew exactly what it meant. I'm not sure, because you know how it feels to know nothing. You know what eventually you come out of it, you can see. How it feels really to be completely cut off from everything, I don't think if you don't experience it, yes. you cannot notice. But in fact, the whole adventure was taken to experience that sense of being cut off from everything. To have the sen experience of complete self-loss, the experience of complete self-forgetfulness of your divinity, and then the recovery from there. That's what makes it an adventure, isn't it? So there are, it's important to recognize this though, there are equally poises of consciousness which chose to not enter the complete oblivion, which chose not to enter the full self-forgetfulness, but hold them themselves on an edge. These are the poises which have formed the beings on the other planes of consciousness, in the vital, the mental, even the spiritual ranges of these worlds. In the mental worlds also you have these spiritual ranges and beings. And they can grow or evolve within this spectrum of their overall status of consciousness. But to experience the full sense of evolution, from zero to infinity, there are only a few beings perhaps we may say, a few but infinity, <laughs> who chose to enter matter to experience complete self-loss and then from there the journey to complete self-recovery. And so in the larger scheme of things, the beings who did not choose to enter the material domain of evolution, they look upon you and say, wow, you're an adventurous one. You chose to enter that world. Wow. And they look at you respectfully. 
It's interesting, we heard of this from many descriptions of people who went into these worlds in their out-of-body experience and they meet beings of those worlds and they look at you and say, oh, you are from that, wow, respectfully. <laughs> So it's as if in the Divine Consciousness, in the All Possibility, there are all the statuses possible of His play. And the beings or the parts of Him or aspects of Him that choose intermediate levels form those planes. And the part of Him that chose to enter here, that's you. <laughs> when you look at it that way, it seems quite, quite hopeful. <laughs> Because if he chooses to enter, it is with the full power to be able to emerge. And it's all there waiting. That's an interesting question. What influence our uh, evolution will have on these beings of other planes? Often, they may choose not to engage directly with this world of matter. <clears throat> In which case, as we grow, we enter the realms of consciousness which correspond to their worlds and we engage with them and they meet with us, have some interchange. As we benefit from them, they may benefit from us, but without ever having to engage with the material domain. Some of them though, are drawn to turn to the material domain, but not fully entering it. And so they may align with you and put a part of their consciousness with you, joining with you, so that as you grow, you are assisted by that link but they participate in your experience of growth. This is often the case in a lot of us. Sri Aurobindo explains in one of his letters that this whole business of in incarnation and reincarnation is not as simplistic as people make it out to be. You know, one soul gets in, pops out, gets in, pops out and goes through levels. There are all these connections which are there, threads of links, even between souls sometimes, where there may be certain alignments and mutualities, but, and this is what makes for what they call the group soul or the idea of certain beings who are aligned to a particular line of development and evolution. But also at the same time, as you enter these domains, let's put it this way, the psychic being at the level of its current evolution gathers material through the mental vital and then finally the physical matter to link, to form these sheets. In the material it gathers, where is that material? In the universal, let's say of the mental and the vital. Full of beings, forces, energies, conscious, utterly, of that plane. And some of them may say, ah, this is an interesting alignment, this is an interesting approach you're taking, I'm interested. And there's an alignment of their energy drawing in, connecting, supporting. And sometimes this may continue even across lives. So there's a very complex exchange taking place across the planes. And as we grow, as we evolve, it impacts all those planes also. Directly in this manner of alignment or indirectly as you come into those planes and engage with things of that world. Let's say now a musician who wants to bring down a special music, a higher experience unconsciously, not aware of those planes, but living in that grade of consciousness, he is reaching out into the universe, calling for or aspiring to draw a new inspiration. And then there are these beings that say, ah, here's an interesting one, throw in a little bit. But when they throw in their inspiration, there's a link formed and an exchange. So they have never directly engaged with matter or the material evolution, and yet there's something happening. And when this person grows, they may get a benefit of that growth also. So is that alignment always mutual? It need not be more always conscious. It need not be intentionally mutual. But since every connection is a two-way connection, there will always be mutual effects, influences. And even if it is not intentional, the result will still be there. Most people do not realize, some of the most creative people in the world, whether in the music, in fashion industry, in architecture, in simply home decor, 
some of the most creative people exceptional people are so because there is an alignment with some source of inspiration a being beings or just a world from which things pour in or into them and they may not be conscious at all shri rubindo makes reference also to connections that we have interactions we have during the state of we sleep when a part of our consciousness an essential part may go watch the sachidanand and come back that is the most essential core but in between are all the other gradations which briefly open out and link up with things of their plane on their level to the extent that are conscious unconscious awake or developed they may catch things sometimes junk which makes for the bad experiences or if they are more conscious or within you there is a strong turn of the aspiration towards the more beautiful and true then automatically in that unconscious state of the body you tune in to those realms and many kinds of links form energies get exchanged even alignments take place of consciousness which over the coming days weeks or months may lead to physical contact and meeting in the material plane think made in consciousness there never having known each other by name or face but something in alignment of your aspiration links with an effort of another a touch a familiarity a link and that comes down into the material domain pulls together and suddenly you bump into each other at a road corner some accident takes place you drop something they pick up an exchange and somehow there's an exchange of contact and a whole new journey of life begins but all of this is happening on those planes where we are not conscious so shirbindu points out that so much of what's happening which has physical result has already taken place or is happening in a much more complex realm if we were conscious of that we would see that what is happening on the physical plane is a tiny tiny part of the real life that is being lived by us mostly unconscious on the surface there is an interesting uh, description in shri rabindo's record of yoga at a time when he was experimenting with automatic writing but from a consciousness that was already liberated and so he, he was conscious of what he was doing um the certain descriptions there where aspects of personality of different people are being described and then when it comes to the mother it says and more than 300 aspects to her personality now i don't remember the exact thing that i read it long ago but it is an indication of how rich and complex a personality may have developed in its evolution and corresponding to each of those aspects are planes of consciousness and sometimes over time even links alliances relations built with things of those planes which have been worked upon in past lives and it's like when this person is working in the world all these links are there simultaneously through which they can draw influences possibilities and when people meet an aspect within you not yet brought forward may align with the other person's aspect which is brought forward and something clicks and for a while there's a relationship that develops in which this undeveloped aspect within you or unexpressed aspect within you waiting to be expressed developed earlier suddenly comes forward because of that interaction and then you may part and it was an interesting enriching learning experience you've moved on but if you think about it the contact made there on some level an affinity has been built and if at another time the same two people come again in contact that affinity may kick up as a resonance incidentally or more deeply it does not matter so there is a complex web of consciousness and influences that is formed linking us in ways that we are too poor to appreciate its complexity 
and we will resume this the Friday after, which is 16th. Oh. Oh. Oh.